in the group of teachers I studied with were very particular about um, saying to us, as soon as you enter in, essentially was a girls' madrasa, a place where we all studied our Islamic sciences, the very first thing they welcome you in with and they hand to you is the Qur'an, is a mushaf. And they put them all in these beautiful white capes, very satiny kind of white capes, and put these white flower crowns on their heads, and they, they made this whole big beautiful thing, and there was nasheed and song, and you know, they just really um, celebrated them. And I remember standing there <laughs> looking at this you know, ceremony, and I'm thinking, whatever it is that these girls did for the Qur'an, I want this. this I want this to be me one day, inshallah. تبارك مودع البركات فيه فليس لفضله أبدا قصور I was sitting with one of my teachers and I was leaving for America and I said to her, any advice you can give me, you know? And of course, some of the main advice they give in all the years I went back and forth, they would say, you know, keep to your Quran, it is the doorway of da'wah. Keep to your teaching, you must give forward, you know, pay forward what you've received. And she handed me this set of six books. It was a, you know, six volume set. I'd already packed my bags. <laughs> she said, this is hot off the press. We've just uh, published this. And I looked at it, and it said al bast fil qiraat al ashar, right? It's basically a book about the ten qiraat. <laughs> and I looked at this, and I'm heading right back into medical school, <laughs> and um, for my next semester. And I'm looking at this, going, and I actually said to her, I said, maybe somebody else will benefit from this more than I can. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Women of Qur'an, a podcast series shining a light on Muslims and their journeys with the Book of Allah. So whether you are a hafidah or perhaps starting your memorization journey, we pray and we hope that our guests ignite your passion for the greatest book in existence, which is of course the Qur'an. My guest today is Dr. Rani Awad, who I'm very, very excited to have. So Jazakallah khairan for taking the time out uh, and being here today. Mashallah, it's my honor. Thank you for having me. Barakallah Kiki. Dr. Rani Awad is a medical doctor. She is a clinical professor of psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine, where she's also the director of the Stanford Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab, as well as Stanford University's affiliate chaplain and affiliate professor of Islamic studies. In the community, Dr. Rania serves as the president and co-founder of Maristan.org, which is a holistic mental health nonprofit serving Muslim communities and the director of Rahma Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to educating Muslim women and girls. She is faculty of Islamic psychology at Cambridge Muslim College and the Islamic Seminary of America. She is also a senior fellow for Yaqeen Institute and the Institute of Social Policy and Understanding. Prior to studying medicine, Dr. Rania pursued classical Islamic studies in Damascus, Syria, and holds certifications or ijazat in the Quran, Islamic law, and other branches of the Islamic sciences. You can also follow her on her Instagram, which I strongly advise. Um, she is a person of great inspiration. My first question is going to be a bit of like um, a personal story. I remember I was just kind of following you for the medical side of things, the Stanford psychiatry side of things. Obviously, I'm aware of like the work that you do in Dawa, um, the talks that you've given and so on. And um, I happened to be scrolling through your Instagram one day and I see this picture of um, I think it was you receiving your ijazat. Uh, mashallah, I think this was about a year ago um, and subhanAllah I had a moment um, and I remember sharing this with a few of my friends you know Dr. Rania isn't just mashallah a doctor um, but she has the not just the qira'a one qira'a one ijazah um, of the Quran but mashallah you have the ten and I remember it was truly a moment of inspiration for myself having a person to almost look up to who didn't just excel academically, uh, but also uh, within the Quran. So work me back from that. Work me back <laughs> from the the ijazah side of things. Your your Quran journey, um, kind of how it all started. Um, what, what where did it all begin? May Allah bless you. May Allah bless you. Alhamdulillah. Well, it is a long journey, and I'm very humbled um, to even you know to really share what's been very personal and very. Um, 
near and dear to my heart, honestly. Um, yes, about a year ago, subhanAllah, was last Ramadan, so a year ago. Um, alhamdulillah, I was very honored, along with a group of other sisters who were in this class with me who were studying the Ashar Qur'at, the 10 canonical recitations of Qur'an. And um, it, it's interesting, I actually had really wanted to work on this much earlier, but certainly medical work, da'wah work, family, many other reasons, um, it was really not um, tenable <laughs> at that time. And subhanAllah, it was actually the pandemic uh, going on lockdown that actually allowed for even the space and the schedule to be able to work on the Ashar Qur'at. Um, we worked on this for about three years, so it was a three-year journey to get to that point in that particular ijaza. But that's not where it's <laughs> the journey starts. The journey starts much, much earlier for me. Um, so you said walk backwards. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so if I were to walk backwards, I would share with you that, um, let's see, probably, oh, Allahu Akbar, um, 10 years more, maybe more years. Prior to that, I had um, received um, another ijazah that was in the Qira'a of Warish. That was in, um, uh, probably, I think it was one of my last trips, not my last trip to Syria, but one of the last trips before the war. And um, had always wanted to continue from there because if I walked you even further back to essentially what would be my teen years, um, I had worked on my very first ijazah of Qur'an, which is Maqra'at Hafs. And that was, you know, the typical ijaza that you work on, um, particularly in Bilad al-Sham or the surrounding regions um, in which the Qira'ah of Hafs is actually the, the primary Qira'ah. And so it's what everybody works on. Um, I personally had this opportunity as a teenager first to go study in Damascus, Syria. I'm not Syrian. And so it was a big deal, actually, for my family to send me as a young uh, girl um, to a country they've never been to and um, particularly to work on my Qur'an and to work on other things as well, uh, sharia, all, all various aspects of the Islamic sacred sciences. Um, but in Syria, it was very interesting. The group of teachers I studied with were very particular about um, saying to us, as soon as you enter in, it essentially was a girl's madrasa, a place where we all studied our Islamic sciences, the very first thing they welcome you in with and they hand to you is the Qur'an, is a mushaf. And they basically say, um, if you hope to do any form of da'wah or any form of personal or community-based work, um, the doorway or the key is the Qur'an. Don't think that you're going to be able to access any of the other ulum al sharia any of the other sciences, sacred sciences, um, without the Qur'an. This is the primary thing, and this is what you'll focus your time on. And you'll be taking other classes of other subjects, but this is the main thing. And all the girls I was studying with, uh, girls because we were teenagers, <laughs> you know, um, were all studying particularly the Qur'an. Um, and alhamdulillah, in those first early years, uh, probably I think it was my second trip to Syria, still a teenager, <laughs> is when I received my first ijaza in Hafs. And then it would be, um, actually it would have been some years later, was uh, during medical school, actually, is when I received the Hafs, the, the Warish ijaza. And then from there, um, there was this gap of time of not being able to go back directly to the Qur'an. Alhamdulillah, I was working on so many other things, particularly fiqh, which I, Islamic law, which I became specialized in, um, but not so much going back to the Qur'an until the pandemic and the ability to, you know, get work on the ashara altogether. I mean, mashallah, I, I'm sure many of our viewers would find this quite inspirational um, because many of us, and I think it's really important to talk about qira'at even for people who haven't engaged with the Qur'an in the first place, haven't even, you know, um, uh, um, experienced one qira'at and, and receiving an idaza in one qira'at because you realize that the Qur'an has doors upon doors upon doors and it's an endless journey and it's an endless gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and that's why I find it inspirational because when you see the bar is this is, is very high. It's not just you finish your qira'ah of the Quran, you get your ijazah khalas. It's it's not like that. There is so much to aspire to, um, and there's so much to to want to accomplish. Subhanallah, I find that very interesting. Um, your experience in studying in Syria, despite not being Syrian, I think Syria was known um, for yes. its. Syria was very very well known for its both um, Islamic sciences, the Quran. Um, got the privilege before everything that's um yeah, uh, so going on Allah grant all kinds of ease yeah it'll be to the people of syria and Amen. allow it to kind of become better even than it was before subhanallah i mean yeah. can you tell me about perhaps figures who inspired you whether it was within surya or outside of surya outside of your formal time with the quran um where you looked up to those people and you found 
a source of inspiration um, when whilst you were memorizing the Quran? Well, I'll tell you, it honestly was other girls. It was peers, honestly, um, more than anything else. Of course, I met amazing sheikhat and shiuch, you know, men and women scholars who inspired. But really, the the biggest, um, you know, rub, so to say, was really the my peers. I remember um, at this point when I was telling you about a teenager, my parents had moved from one state in the United States to another. And in this new community in which they moved, there was a large Syrian community. And um, we moved in the summertime between school years. And for me, um, somebody in the community said, oh, there's a girl's camp happening in the masjid. You know, my, they said to my mother, you know, send your daughter to it. So she did, and, and I attended, and it was very nice. It was very helpful. And at the end of that camp, the whole group of girls that had been in Syria that summer returned. And at the very tail end of that camp, they held a party for them. And I kept hearing people say, oh, they received their ijaza." And I had no idea what the word ijaza meant. <laughs> you know, it just it didn't mean, make sense to me. What does this word mean? And they kept saying, we're going to have an ijaza party. And I was like, okay, ijaza party. <laughs> 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 and so the day came for this ijaza party. And they put these girls, who were all my age, just about, or a little older, and they put them all in these beautiful white capes, very satiny kind of white capes, and put these white flower crowns on their heads. And they, they made this whole big, beautiful thing. And there was nasheed and song. And you know they just really um, celebrated them. And I remember standing there as, at this point, I'm about uh, 13. And I'm standing there <laughs> looking at this you know, ceremony. And I'm thinking, whatever it is that these girls did for the Quran, I want this. this I want this to be me one day, inshallah. And I kept asking people, what did you do? Where did you go? How was it? And they said, Syria, Syria. It just all kept going back to Syria. <laughs> and I thought, okay. So I went home. Then I said to my parents, I have to go to Syria. <laughs> this <know>? is crazy. <laughs> and they said to me, you're not Syrian. How are you going to go to Syria by yourself? And I said, well, I want to do whatever those girls did. you know." And subhanAllah, there's a long story of how I actually got to Syria. But subhanAllah was really the inspiration from those, um, you know, those girls in that party. And that's why celebrating it is so beautiful and important. I agree. And I, you know what I was thinking as well? Um, I remember going back to <laughs> that Instagram post of yours. Um, I remember thinking we are shy to share our Islamic accomplishments, our Quran, especially memorizing the Quran, because we don't want the uh, and we don't like we don't want to show off and um, we don't want to, you know, but but with the academics, we're excellent. Oh, yeah. We're like, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. these are my publications. This is the university I went to and, and everything. And I remember being like, no. SubhanAllah, especially seeing your post, yes, we should show the world, and like those girls did, what it's like, what in, what is this ijaza party, you know? What is this, what is she wearing? Why is she wearing a crown? Why is she being gowned? And SubhanAllah, all of that is really reflective of, inshallah, we hope the process in the akhirah, right? Yeah, Rabbi. Um, inshallah, and I agree with you on that point, and I find it beautiful that that is what inspired you as a child, because we have many girls um, and women um, who are a lot and older who never had the opportunity. Yes. Yes. I think it's definitely something to talk about and not to shy away from. Inshallah, we obviously ask to be sincere in, in that either way. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about um, the Qira'at. When did you decide, especially because you went from Hafs, which is very different to Warsh. Mm-hmm. Um, Warsh is commonly, I believe, recited in Algeria and so on. North Africa, yeah. How did you go on to, were you, were you offered it? Or did you think, okay, I've reached a milestone now. I've, I've got my ijazah. What inspired you um, and motivated you to, to yeah. keep going? Well, I'll tell you, the first ijazah was incredibly hard. The Hafs ijazah for me. Um, I, unlike some of the girls in my community that I moved into, um, I didn't grow up necessarily, of course we all grew up reading Quran to some extent, uh, Sunday schools, I did go to Islamic schools, so we had a basis, alhamdulillah, but not to the point that it was the kind of fluency and tajweed, I had never even heard the word tajweed before that point, you know, so when I first started to read, it really felt like a, you know, a, a da, 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 you know, kind of situation. And I thought, oh, wow, I'm really far behind so many of the people of my own community who literally have been raised with this since, you know, since infancy, literally. Or maybe they've had their own moms, mothers, mashallah, and this amazing group of women who had studied the Quran. Many of them themselves were hafidat or had ijaz and sentajweed. That wasn't necessarily my story. So it was a, it was a, it was a climb. It was a lift to get to this uh, point. And there was a lot of tears, you know, and a lot of, you know, what teens do, they compare one to another, compare yourself to others, (laughs) subhanAllah. And I just kept making dua, and I had a teacher say to me for that first ijaz, he said to me, you know, as hard as this is for you, it will mean that much more to you. 
And it's true. Something that you fight for and you work hard for, um, you don't let go of it easily because you know how much you worked for it and how hard it was for you. Sometimes when things come easy to you, you don't realize, subhanAllah, you don't realize the, 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 the blessing that you have. So anyhow, that was the story with Hafs initially. And then in those years, so that was a teenage year, right? Right after that, I entered university. And um, subhanAllah, my, as I mentioned, my Islamic studies were continuing kind of in parallel with all of my academic studies, high school, mm -hmm. college, medical school, uh, you know, really going on a pretty intensive level of study uh, parallel. And I didn't share this with the world, with anybody. I was really doing this for myself personally. But as soon as I got to university, people started to notice that there was, that I could teach. And they were asking, can, he, can I read to you? Can I read to you? Can you listen to my Quran? Can I listen to my Quran? Um, can you teach me Tajweed? So I would have these mini halakas out of my <laughs> university apartment, <laughs> subhanAllah. Um, all of these uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one students that I was teaching Quran to, and, um, and eventually became other topics too. And uh, when I, then in this period of time, this university period, I was the first time I actually came to California. I'm not from California. At that point, I'm in the Midwest. And um, I was uh, out here for a, uh, an Islamic intensive, um, summer intensive, basically. And I noticed that w all these women were coming to me saying, can I read to you? And I would say, sure. And they would say, in, ha in, in Wedish. And I would say, I'm not trained in Wedish. You yeah. know, I'm trained in Hafs. <laughs> they would say, but, you know, we are, that most of them came from a Maliki madhab, meaning mm. that was the, in the Maliki school, out of the four schools of Islamic law, um, I in their school, uh, it's actually uh, mandub, it's actually the best thing to be able to recite in Wadish, in their prayer. So they actually wanted to learn Wadish, or they had originally, this is how they grew up and learned it. And I thought, oh, I'm really, uh, I want to be able to help these young women. I'm helping all these other people in Hafs. I want to be able to help them too. But I knew that in Syria, which I was going back and forth at this period of time, right, back and forth to study, but I knew that they would not allow you to have an ijaza in just one qira'a beyond the Hafs one. They mm -hmm. would do hafs, and then you have to do all ten in a row yeah. together. And so, but I would go for very limited periods of time. I sometimes would have just weeks or months. Sometimes I'd have longer periods of time to be able to study there. But often, often I was studying here and then going there to basically test or very intensely, like a couple of really intense mm -hmm. months of study, and then come back. And I thought, how am I going to do this? So I actually asked permission of the sheikh. There's different shiuch who give the ijaza, who are who are you know um, the people who are. Um, given permission by Wazarat al-Awqaf, basically the ministry that allows for this. So you have to go through the proper channels to receive ijaza, not just anybody can give you ijaza. And so the sheikh that had originally given me the Hafs ijaza, we asked special permission for the Warsh ijaza, and he said, I've never given this as a one-time thing. Mm -hmm. And so they tried to explain to him, she's going, at that point I was actually going to be getting married and coming to California, I knew this already. And I, I said to the community, uh, to the shiuch there, I said, you know, but I'm going to be in a community that is going to keep asking about Warsh. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm marrying into a family that's uh, all Maliki, for example, and, mm -hmm. and, and I'm going to have all these uh, requests. And they said, oh, for da'wah purposes, allow her to do just the Warsh. And he said, okay. You know, and so I did actually study with my teachers and kind of test all the way up until I was ready to be tested by him. And it was so cute the day of the Wadish Ijaza, because they actually gave you a, it's a very big certificate with the full Senate, you know, all the way through. And um, he said, but I only have the Hafs one printed. <laughs> <laughs> and so I literally had to like write in Wadish onto my Ijaza. You could still see it now, it's hung up on my wall at home. It's, you know, you could see the handwriting in as, as Wadish. But it was very sweet. And he said, this is the first one I'm giving as, a, you know, in you know, Rahimahullah, SubhanAllah. And it was such an honor to, to be able to come back into this California-based community that needed the Warsh um, Qira'a um, and be able to, to use it and help with it. I mean, SubhanAllah, that is both entertaining and it, SubhanAllah, like, I think you have stories to tell, like journeying with the Qur'an yes, and also yes. especially because you, you, you traveled as well, so it was a different people that you engaged with and it's a, it's a whole experience. Um, I'm sure there are many, many stories to tell. Um, and subhanAllah, you know, you can tell them to your children and, and other people um, uh, to, to inspire them and, and yeah, to share the reality of, of memorizing the Quran. It's not like you go in, you memorize the Quran, you walk out, no. Um, and especially because you did Qarsh, which is, by the way, one of, I think, if not the most, or one of the most dif dif different. Well, it is. It's on the spectrum. It's definitely on the other side of the spectrum of the Qira'at. And they said to me at the time, they said, you know, if you, if you, if you, 
shall not master you know, none of us never master anything, but it's you do your best with um hops and you do with the wadish, then it's going to be a lot easier to actually attain the others. I've between. had that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've yeah. had that. And so fast forward um to restarting um this this journey um sorry kind of restarting right going back to trying to complete the other qiraat i'm sure there was a burning passion for years but you were obviously very busy with at what point medical school at this at this point yeah, oh. it would have been medical school and then you know it is medical school followed by residency followed by fellowship followed very by intense faculty so it's it mashallah it was all all in a row um the main thing that the, the burning desire was that when i received that what is she jazza and I was heading back to America. I was there for just a few months. This was in medical school, probably my first year. And the um, the teacher, I was sitting with one of my teachers, and I was he- leaving for America. And I said to her, any advice you can give me? you know?" And, of course, some of the main advice they give in all the years I went back and forth, they would say, you know, keep to your Quran. It is the doorway of da'wah. Keep to your teaching. You must give forward, you know, pay forward what you've received. They insisted that we would teach. There's no such thing as receiving and not giving after mm-hmm. you received. Uh, I really honor. I really am. It's such an honor to have learned with such te- teachers that had so much foresight that you can't just sit on something you've learned. You have to. Yeah. It doesn't matter how busy you are. It doesn't yeah. matter that you say you're a doctor. It doesn't matter anything. And yeah. I would say nope, nope, nope. Dawa's dawa, regardless Absolutely. of what you're doing, <laughs> and regardless of where you end up. Which, which is another part of the story because subhanAllah, in one, of the, in one of the phases of my life, I ended up in a very small city with very small Muslim community and they said, grow where you're planted. Mm. Yes. <laughs> subhanAllah. <laughs> Anyhow, on that trip as I was leaving, she, um, she said, hold on, wait a minute, I have to give you something. And so she called for somebody to go to the bookstore they came back and she handed me this set of six books. It was a you know six volume set. I'd already packed my bags. <laughs> I remember reading about this actually. <laughs> and I thought, how am I gonna carry this set of, and I, she said, this is hot off the press. We've just uh, published this. This is one of the first copies. And I said, what am I to do with it? And she said, this you're gonna have to study when you go back home. And I looked at it and it said, Al-Bast fil Qiraat al-Ashar. Right, it's basically a book about the ten qiraat, and I recognized the name of the sheikha who had written the book. She's very, very famous, subhanallah, and incredibly accomplished. And they said, "Oh, she's created this very interesting way of putting the, all the qiraat together and showing you the differences between the qiraat." And you know, it's a six volumes. <laughs> and I looked at this, and I'm heading right back into medical <laughs> school, and um, for my next semester, and I'm looking at this going. And I actually said to her, I said, maybe somebody else will benefit from this more than I can. You know, I, I don't know when I'll get to this. And she said, no, no, you're gonna, you're going to study this. And I said, <laughs> I don't know what she was foreshadowing, subhanAllah. And so anyhow, it sat on my shelf, my bookshelf at home for years, for years. You know, and I would pass it as I was going in and out of the house, you know, into medical school, residency, one child, second child, you know. You know, started my faculty appointment, third child, you know. It was just, and, you know, it's, and you, you know, and I just felt so incredible. But there just simply wasn't the time of day. It, qira'at is a, it's, it's, it's like you're learning a new language. Wow. And, our, and the group, mashallah, that I joined um, to learn the qira'at, <laughs> that wasn't easy either, you know. Subhanallah, my teacher now will kind of laugh and say, you know, I, I almost didn't even make it into the class <laughs> cause, because they test you before you go in. And it had been a significant gap of time, you know, I, from the time she gave me that, from, from the time of that ijaza to the time I started, you know, picking it up again. I, I've lost track of how many years exactly, but I think it's at least, it's over 10 years, right? And it's not that I wasn't doing anything with Quran since, however, it's the, the meticulousness of reading, right? Yes, it, it you get rusty, subhanAllah. And so um so she she had me kind of refresh a little bit and I did and then she accepted me into the class and I say that story because it doesn't ha- I don't have to say that story, but the reason I say that is to inspire people that even if you've had in your young like me, you started early in your younger years to study and you had Quran in your early years and you want to come back to it and to really like um, make it you know solidify it again, there's no shame. Even if you feel like you're rusty a little bit again, mm-hmm. no shame. You just start from wherever. You, you start from zero if you have to. Mostly you're not going to start from zero, but mm-hmm. you'll start from wherever you need to start from and you work your way up. And um, subhanAllah, the qira'at, there were many tears in the qira'at class too because, and she said that. She said, I had many tears. I said, okay, Because <laughs> <laughs> it was like here, it's like a math- mathematical analysis of figuring out the jama'ah because we did it in jama'ah, oh. in 
all together, all yeah. ten mm-hmm. together. First the seven, then you add the three. And, you know, it's, it's, there's those moments where you're like, oh, I need to quit. I don't have the ability to do this. <laughs> you know, I have all these other things happening in my life, family and work and, you know, so on and other, and other forms of da'wah. Um, and subhanAllah, I, I say this about the pandemic, it was the most amazing um, blessing in disguise in the, the weirdest way in that I just, because of how busy my schedule was of going up and down and commuting and traveling and being literally in a different city in a, every day of the week, um, sometimes it was medical things, sometimes it was dawah related things, sometimes it was, it was teaching at Zaytuna, sometimes it was this, sometimes it was that. I just was everywhere. And the pandemic just collapsed all of it and you, I was just home. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, the gaps of time in my commutes, literally hours of commuting in California here, mm-hmm. subhanAllah, um, could be used in the Quran. And it was just a real blessing, subhanAllah. It really is, subhanAllah, because yeah. you you managed to accomplish that. And obviously it is it is a journey that, you know, the journey of Hafla, it's, it's, you, you kind of have to preserve the Quran. It's not like you memorize. I, I'm sure we all, we all have journeys um, for life, but, Subhanallah, it's beautiful that Allah Allah chose you and Allah gifted you with not just the first qira'ah, not just the second difficult qira'ah, but all ten. Like Subhanallah, it's a choosing of Allah, and um, I think people who get to accomplish um, any part of memorization, whether it's just one juz, that is a gift from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and I, it's very inspiring. May Allah allow us the opportunity, inshallah, um, to um, learn the Quran in the multiple qira'ahs, to teach it, and to be from Ahlul Qur'an, from the people of Qur'an who act upon um, upon that. What enjoyment do you feel you get from the Qira'at? Because for those who might not know, um, I understand that the Qira'at kind of have a little bit of different me- different meanings, but within the same kind of, do you get to enjoy that? As a person who I'm guessing understands some form of Arabi, do you get to enjoy that? And do you get to, yeah, do you get to just enjoy your own Qira'at? Um, because you have multiple variations that you can appreciate um, in one go. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is something our, mm, I'll tell you something, though. Um, it's it's still very new, as in to say it's only a year old for me. So um, there are times where, and I've, I've talked to the other, the other some of the other sisters in, in my group, um, and there's a similar sentiment of like, we're all kind of a little bit scared, to be honest, to like make any mistakes. And mm-hmm. there's still, and I remember, I remember the same feeling when I first received my ijaz. And it takes a while to kind of like, it takes some time to feel like you're comfortable and mm-hmm. you're kind of able to not just help yourself, but even potentially anybody else. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not there. I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> but in terms of reading with the differences of um, the differences, it's beautiful. And sometimes you say, oh, I wonder what that means. And then you kind of look into the meaning of the tafsir because they do change and, and you see and it's it's like you said it's not going to change the actual content itself but it's kind of a variation of what exactly you know the meaning might be um or an alternative to the meeting and you say oh subhanallah that's really fascinating it's very beautiful yeah um definitely i think just you know anyone can kind of look into this um where different mufassirun have like explained yeah i, I believe in fiqh um, when you come to derive, I mean, you know a lot more than this, but you have to look at the different qira'at because um, there are different m- different technicalities that can become apparent um, from the different ayat. Well, there's so much to unpack there. Um, tell me a little bit about why you chose to um, pursue some Islamic sciences. What were they? Um, and um, why did you keep going? Obviously, you um, had your accomplishments in the Qur'an. You were like mid-med school and training and... Um, why wh- why did you um, turn to Islamic sciences and how do you feel that has fed into who you are today? SubhanAllah, that's very much a personal journey, I would say. It was, um, you know, you, mashallah, the place where I studied in Syria, the teachers of whom I studied with, they were very much um, committed to excellence in everything. And it's a beautiful thing. I often talk about this, um, particularly with the Rahma Foundation, the women's organization that I helped co-found, is that you have to, um, seeing is believing. Sometimes you literally have to see this in action. And I did see women who, subhanAllah, had the Qur'an memorized and were also studying the various ulum or teaching the various Islamic sciences in addition to <laughs> having their careers and high-level degrees, um, in addition to most, not all, but many, I would say the majority, were also wives and mothers. That combination is really hard to see today. I'm 
positive, this would have been a combination that we would have seen earlier in Islam. And it was very rare to see it kind of in the modern era. And sometimes you literally have to see <laughs> to believe it. And when people kind of point it out to me, I say, I'm just doing what I saw my teachers do. I mean, there's, there's, uh, you think I'm special? I'm just a blade, simple blade of grass <laughs> compared to all the rest of them. <laughs> Subhanallah, what's the of Allah? And in the studying of the various ulum, you can't just kind of focus on one. You kind of have to really study your farda'in, you know, your personally obligatory knowledge, which means some of aqidah and some of, the, uh, you know, fiqh and some of tafsir and some of hadith and some of, you know, and you kind of at least have your personally obligatory knowledge down. And that's, you know, the first level. And then from there, the ability, alhamdulillah, for the Allah to be able to go back and forth and continue to study meant deeper and deeper and deeper knowledge. And it also eventually meant specialization. So so all we took all of the basic arnum, alhamdulillah. And then from there, it was interesting. Either you might find yourself inclined to some specific subject or your teachers pick it for you mm -hmm. and say, you are really good at this subject, yeah. for example, go deeper. Right, go into the higher level texts and get ijazas in the higher level mm -hmm. sciences. And for me, that became fiqh. Um, not, not that's not everybody's cup of tea. Yeah, <laughs> but it was mine. I was very interested in it. And alhamdulillah, in the Shafi'i fiqh, um, I did actually go quite far up. Alhamdulillah, in terms of my ijazas, and was able to then um, teach. You know, so I was formally teaching both um, halakat and classes, but also officially, like for example, at the Zaytuna College. For almost 10 years, that was the, I was their chef, I feel teacher. You sure. know what I mean? Yeah. Mashallah, I'm sure that's that's practically useful for yourself, like you said, as well as the community and the people around you. Alhamdulillah that you get to take um, such developed uh, sciences from like Surya and places that, that they specialize in for many years, centuries uh, and bring it to the West um, and, you know, um, use it as a means of da'wah. Um, what would you say was your most intense period in life? And how did you, how did you go about? I know we talk a lot about balancing, because this is all the conversation: balancing Dean, uh, balancing the Dawa, balancing your personal like Quran, everything. Um, any learnings, whether it was you know like the time that you shone, or perhaps just felt like you, it was low, your lowest point in in, in trying to balance everything. Um, what would that be? And any practical kind of advice that you can give? Um, to myself and, and yeah. others. Yeah, yeah. There's um there's a couple pieces of practical advice. Honestly, it's not like they're they're ones that I personally created. There's one there it's advice that I've learned from my teachers and then attempted attempted <laughs> to implement <laughs> to the best of my ability. And yes, there definitely are times where you flow you know, you kinda like you, you falter, you know, you 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 do kind of fall even, subhanAllah. But always surround yourself with um those who are going to truly have your best interests at heart. Um, always surround yourself with teachers, people who are um, who you're going to take advice from and you keep on asking for that advice and nasiha, and at the same time who are able to call you out for when you're doing too much or you're spreading yourself too thin or you need to refocus and recenter. If you don't have that relationship, you might go about thinking all is good, but there's people suffering in your life because of how spread thin you are. And yes, certainly that's happened for me a few times. And I'm so thankful for my teachers, spiritual teachers, who have, you know, picked up the phone <laughs> or wrote me a message and said, Rania, mm -hmm. recenter, <laughs> recenter, you know, and I appreciate that. And sometimes it's hard to hear that. It's, it's you know, it's it's um, bitter medicine, yeah. <laughs> you know, but it's important to have that in your life. I would also say that a lot of the, um, there's there's no way that any one person, even if you they seem like they're doing a lot of things, that they do it alone. I know that's true in my story. Like I have a lot of help to do the work that I do, um, including probably the most, you asked about them, some of the most difficult moments um, were definitely in that medical school. I, I personally uh, got married very early in my medical studies, um, had my first child halfway through <laughs> my medical studies, um, entered into this you know, psychiatry Stanford residency training program with a very young child. She was a year, a year and a half when I started my training. Um, my mother helped tremendously, as did others, um, as did other community members, subhanAllah, who said, you know, let us help. <laughs> you're you're a like, let us help, you know. And I really appreciate that. And it was really hard to ask for help. So many of us want to be this, you know, we, we buy into this superwoman mentality of like, I have to do it all and do it perfectly and do it alone without help. And none of that is makes sense. All of it is honestly kind of silly. Um, but to seek out help, and to be humble enough to take that help. 
and also to be humble enough to take the criticism when someone, you know, especially those who are older and wiser, uh, spiritually older, spiritually wiser, are able to say, this is going to be harmful, backtrack. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Um, there's a beautiful model that I share often in my halaqat and my classes with, that I've learned from my teachers. I don't, I don't know if you've heard me say this ever, but the concentric circles. I love this one. I think it's so powerful and important for all people, but especially, I'll say, for women, that you, the core is always your relationship with Allah, Zawajan, because if that gets shaken, your, your very core and foundation is shaken, right? So that has to remain priority. Your prayers, your fasting, your Quran, your, you, your relationship with God. And then immediately outside of it is your relationship with your family, right? And so when married, that's your husband. And if you have children, they're in that sort of immediate circle outside as well. And then um, comes your parents, the next circle out with your siblings, further out your family, further out your community, further out the ummah, further out humanity. And the reason I say that, and it seems kind of obvious, but it's not, <laughs> is that if you find yourself spread too thin, you know, like I had refugee work that I was doing, I was traveling up and down here and there and across the world and so on. And if the fa if anything in the inner core starts to suffer, you immediately take one step in, two steps in, right? And you have to let go of the, the, the further out things the, because those are not priority. But so many of us get deluded, subhanAllah, and we get the, the kind of the, the, the kind of the, the fancy, um, shiny things mm -hmm. are on the further out circles. The humanitarian aid, right? the outside, yeah. The day-to-day -day washing dishes and you know cleaning up after your kids after the 15th time that they made a mess mm -hmm. in the room is not where the shiny, glamorous <laughs> things are, subhanAllah. But those are the people that Allah is going to ask you about first, after your personal relationship with him like your prayers, right? Mm -hmm. And so if those are not solid, then none of that actually matters. If you saved the dolphins, that's beautiful, but none of that's going to matter the way if your child is able to say, my parent actually was there for me and mm. took care of me as they should have and raised me as they should have, subhanAllah. And everyone has their challenges and everyone has their tests in life. Don't, don't get me wrong. And it could be the very things you spent a lot of time in become your tests, subhanAllah. So don't, don't get me wrong. But the priority of the order of priority needs to be known and understood better. Subhanallah, that's Subhanallah. very, very insightful. And yeah, I've had that alongside many of your talks, which I will just, I will just sit, listen to a podcast and it would be you and a few other, um, uh, a few other scholars, female scholars, alhamdulillah, a lot from the US actually, you guys are very, are quite for, um, forthcoming with like your da'wah, spe specifically women. Um, and it's so nice to have people to look up to and and to take from um, because you can, you can share the things about washing the dishes and the, your own kind of, personal um, responsibilities of being a mother and so on, and it's relatable. Um, you mentioned the Rahman Foundation. Can you tell me a little bit more about that um, and um, how it was born and um, what, what work you do with it? Yeah, yeah, of course, inshallah. It's one of my, uh, what I hope, inshallah, the things that I hope have qabul, ya Rab, acceptance Amen. from Allah. Um, the Rahman Foundation is a non-profit, um, not-for-profit, 501c3, as we call it here in the US, uh, foundation. That is a work that it, its main mission is educating Muslim women and girls in the deen. And the way it was founded is, subhanAllah, as I mentioned, I had come out to California for some, actually it was an invitation by one of the shiuch here. And um, in, in that process, met other women who were studying. And subhanAllah, everyone came from a different place of study. I had gone to Syria. Some of the other women had never left America, but the Zaytuna Institute at the time had a lot of visiting scholars from Mauritania and other places. So they had accomplished quite a bit. Some had gone to Yemen, some had gone to, uh, you know, the Diobendi system of, of, you know, had gone to South Africa or the UK even in, in the madrasa systems. And um, each one of us came from a different minhaj, from a different, you know, study background, but all of us had the same kind of background of studying the sacred sciences, having ijazas in them. Sure. And uh, we said, let's put together a women's conference. The year here would have been something like 2004, maybe, oh, <laughs> something wow. around this time. And we said, OK, let's do that. And it was very successful. All these women flew in from everywhere. We thought to ourselves, where are all these people <laughs> coming from, subhanAllah? And so we had hundreds of women come to this in-person women's conference that we did here in California. So the next year, we repeated it. And by the third year, as we were planning this, we wrote to the shiuch, the local shiuch of this area. And we said, um, there's so much interest from the woman. And it was actually Imam Zayd Shakir, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, these are some of the main people in this area. And they uh, said to us, it's time for the woman to have their own organization. 
clearly even their best students had always been women. Yeah. <laughs> they said, and they said, the women need their own space. And we said, okay. So we came together as a group of four ustadas that then co-founded the Rahma Foundation. And we struggled for a little bit to trigger, figure out the name of this organization. And we said, women, the main thing is the Rahma and mercy, Rahma, we're going to do, you know, Rahma Foundation. Mashallah. And since then, subhanAllah, um, in these many years that have passed, alhamdulillah, we do uh, programs for women and for girls. So currently, for example, um, we have this Friday night programs that we run with the girls starting from age four all the way through high school. They're halaqa, different halakas of the different that are age specific. And parallel with that happening is a Friday night halakha for the woman. Mm -hmm. So that is in parallel. So when you hear me giving my halakha, there's always, uh, you know, hundreds, literally hundreds of other girls that are sitting in the in their halakhas in yeah. the same masjid space. And this is now on Zoom and kind of online. Everybody's welcomed to attend the woman's side of this. And also workshops and classes. Um, and we have a, a girls' sharia program. It's its own program called Nur al-Iman, but it's actually running outside of our Rahma office. We have a physical location as well. And um, the girls are doing, uh, one of our main ustadas, some, some of our main ustadas actually teach in that sharia program. So now you have middle school and high school girls who are learning basically a call of like a junior alamiya program. So they're doing the Quran and the Hadith and the Fiqh and Tatsayyid and the Hadith and all, all, all the subjects, mashallah. mashallah. And the goal is, and they're all in school as well, and the goal is that you have these young girls who are going to become the next generation of our women teachers. They're grounded in the deen. They have those studies. They have initial studies to then continue on with high-level ijazas if they wish. And they have their schooling to where they, you know, inshallah, do very well in whatever career or, or non-career path that they choose and become our teachers and mentors of the community here. It's very important to me that it just doesn't die out with, you know, the group of us women who had studied and had the opportunity to travel overseas and study in that day and age. But actually there's homegrown young women who are becoming the scholars, inshallah, one day scholars and teachers of our community. Exactly. I think it's beautiful that you've included that because a lot of people watching, um, whether it's the UK or other parts of the world, might think that we are not going to have the opportunity of traveling and so on. But inshallah, Allah will bring someone to you who's had that and can, like you said, homegrown. I like that word. Um, that's very inspiring. And I love the sound of Rahman Foundation. Um, I'm sure it's very beneficial. May Allah preserve it yeah, um, yeah. and um, accept it from you and the others, all the many other people I'm sure involved. Um, I know we're quite uh, tight for time. So there's so much. I, I wish I honestly, Dr. Rania, I wish I had all day with you. There is so many uh, just side, side questions in my head um, about um, the different things that you mentioned. Um, the, the, the biggest thing I kind of want to tackle to kind of um, uh, start finishing off um, is psychiatry um, and then Islam and then Quran. And, and I'm, not, I'm not even the best person to ask the right question when it comes to this, but I will leave it to you. My opening question is what inspired you to go into psychiatry? Let's start with that. Um. <laughs> it's a loaded question, I guess. Um, and because I did not intend to go into psychiatry, this was not my, um, I did not see this in my in my plan. But subhanAllah, we plan and Allah plans. And Allah's the best of planners. Um, it was actually my deen work. It was actually the work that I was doing in terms of my da'wah, the, the halaqat, the classes, the teaching um, in the community. And um, when you teach, subhanAllah, you have people who come to you with all kinds of questions and, and issues that are happening in their life. They have, uh, I learned very quickly, <laughs> very quickly in those first few years of teaching, subhanAllah, um, that as much as I had studied and as much as I could literally even had memorized and can like line for line read to you what was in the books and say to you, this is halal, this is haram, this is the ruling, this is the kaza. Uh, the reality is what people were coming in, the, the concerns that were very multifaceted and were very um, intense, actually. And it wasn't just a matter of what's halal, what's haram. It was a lot more of, which is what, which was my forte in terms <laughs> of the fiqh I studied, right? But this was a lot more of like, help me deal with this family situation that's happening. I don't know what to do with this trauma that I've experienced. What happens with this person in my life who's who's affected me in this way and they're still in my life? What do I do? You know. Very, very multi-layered questions. And I felt I'm out of sorts. Like I just, I'm out of my league, you know, to try to help in this situation. And I'm, as I mentioned, I was already in medical school and I was planning on going to something completely different, <laughs> inshallah. My husband is all is, is a sheikh and uh, somebody who um, is very deeply studied, mashallah, as well. 
and also was teaching the community. And I say that because um, sometimes you have to see the two the two sides of the, <laughs> the equation. And he also, because he could, he also had, you know, he's a mufti, mashallah, of his madhab. I mean, he knows, he very deeply studied and is able to answer many, many things, subhanAllah, even beyond me. And um, he too was feeling like there's more to the story that we haven't trained on. And so there was an incident that happened in the community. Uh, you know, sometimes I share the story in depth and sometimes I, you know, reserve it because I, it, it's a hard story, mm -hmm. but it's one of what I could tell you now. All of the very learned learned people that were amongst us in this uh, area, none of them really could point to this issue being a mental health issue. Everybody, the community members included, kept saying, read Quran for this individual, make dua for them. Maybe it's a jinn, maybe mm -hmm. it's this, maybe it's ayin. I mean, they had all these other explanations for what was happening. And today, as a psychiatrist, I could say to you, actually what's happening to this young woman was an early, a case of early psychosis, a first break psychosis. Mm -hmm. And nobody could really sense, even very mm -hmm. learned people, very well-meaning people, but nobody had the language to explain that this was actually a health condition. And subhanAllah, that night, um, after my husband uh, had tried along with other community members and actually got, in fact, what happened was, uh, short, long story short, he called, a, subhanAllah, a dentist out of all people in our community. <laughs> But he was an elder, and this particular elder had given a lot of khutbahs, and he mm. was very passionate about uh, people getting help when they needed. And he would talk about things nobody would talk about, domestic violence, mm. uh, mental health, things early on, like in the days where nobody was talking about these things. So my husband remembered this, and he called him, and he described what was happening to this young woman. And he said, uh, this you know elder of ours said, this is a medical emergency. She needs the ER. Yeah. She needs a physician. Yeah. And so they took her, subhanAllah. And when he returned, my husband returned from that trip, he, he said to me that night, he said, have you ever considered, you know, psychiatry? And the way he said it was really funny, too. He actually said, you know, I, I was planning on going to obstetrics. So he said to me, you know, I know you want to help a lot of the Muslim women. I know Muslim women need women doctors. I get it. He said, however, many people who are trained can, you know, deliver a baby well. Yeah. <laughs> But not many people are trained in the deen and can help the mental health of our community. And that's when I said to him, what are you talking about? <laughs> and then he said, have you considered psychiatry? And I was like, psychiatry? <laughs> Why would I ever do that? <laughs> you know, Why would I ever do that? <laughs> and you're talking to somebody, and I, say, I share this very important point. You're talking to somebody who, when I was in university, had never, ever taken even a single course in psychology. Because I thought it was just garbage, just rubbish. Like, what is you're speaking this Speaking to a surgeon, a, a budding surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> what is this rubbish? You know, I, I really thought, anyway, what does this have to do with yeah. us? And it's such a humbling, <laughs> full circle experience it's kind of, long, yeah. of coming to this point of realizing, um, you know, and it's it's actually all of that, it's all of that initial angst and, and trepidation and just sort of even a lack of trust of the field of psychiatry, some of which is warranted, okay? Mm -hmm. but much, of which would, would, which would, much of which was actually ignorance. Um, but the reality is, was when I got here to Stanford, I remember those first <laughs> few weeks, you know, and I was kind of like, what am I doing here? And why not, not the Stanford part, but the psychiatry part, you know, what am I supposed to do as a practicing Muslim who's teaching the dean in the community? Like, what am I doing here? And that started a lot of the initial readings. I thought, well, I, I've learned how to read the old and texts from our studies, right, from our Sharia studies. What did the scholars say about mental health? They're, they must have said something. Yeah. And that led to a lot of the early writings and reading readings that became writings that it became publications and really s developed my lab. Is yeah. this the Stanford um, Muslim? I'm going to get this wrong. The Stanford Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology yeah, Lab. Yeah, yeah, it was the beginnings of the Stanford Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab. What little gems can you just share? I think I've you I, I've seen a couple of the things that you've done. You kind of go back in time, right, to see how. Islam dealt with some of these things, I think. But you, you're the expert here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the lab does and what, what it focuses on? And um, I guess it's an intersection um, in a way. Um, mm, very much so, yeah. Uh, there's many lines of research in the lab. The historical line is one of them. Okay. And that particular line does, in fact, go back into the early texts. You know, it looks at and we published on the likes of Abu Zayd al-Balakhi or Ibn Sina or Razi or, you know, all these greats who we kind of showed actually like Al-Balkhi specifically, you know, showed actually, you know, you have people who have discovered clinical conditions like obsessive compulsive disorder or even oh. other clinical conditions, mm. phobia, such, 
um, much earlier than what the current books on psychology and psychiatry say. And that's really important because it rewrites the narrative that's usually very Eurocentric, that's very focused mm -hmm. on a very you know Western modality of treatment. And to say, no, 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 hold on. There are many civilizations that have contributed to um, historically to the understanding of human psyche. And the Muslims specifically were very interested in the medicalized treatment of these conditions, not just the spiritual treatment. Mashallah which is very important. They understand the ayin and they talk about the jinn and yes, sure, all of this. And here is the medicalized treatment, classification, diagnosis, and treatment that includes the spiritual, but definitely has the medical. And this is why you know the newest thing that I'm working on and one of the newest parts of the, the research in the lab is on the institutions of healing that they created, the madistans, right? And hoping to revive this tradition that's very holistic. But yes, there's multiple lines of research, one of which is historical, but then there's other lines of research on what I call more contemporary, more mm, taboo topics, suicide, substance abuse, you know, things related to other difficult topics within the Muslim community that are very important to bridge religion and spirituality because otherwise the psychiatric resources we have today are very secular. Yeah. They're good, but they're not going to help us fully unless you bring the deen aspect into it. SubhanAllah, that's very interesting. I find that very, very interesting in the very little psychiatry that we've done in medical school. Um, uh, SubhanAllah, some of the things you were mentioning, because I think a lot of a lot of us, even even as medical doctors with very little experience in psychiatry, you have those ideas of, oh, is it Ayn? Is it this? Um, and then you read about psychosis and you read about all these things and you start thinking back, honestly, relatives that were misdiagnosed um, and, you know, we thought they had this, they had a gin, they had a God knows what. And you're going back just as, just as a young medical student I mean, like, oh, wow, no, no, they had this textbook. Um, so, subhanAllah, this is so interesting. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know many Muslims, mashallah, who are very learned in the Islamic sciences who have the psychiatry experience and training and are at that intersection. Um, and I'm so glad we have a Muslim woman like you in, in that space. Um, I look very forward um, to actually looking more into, um, into, the, into the lab and, and the work that you do. Um, what else does it involve? It is a research lab, yes. Uh, there is also clinical research. My, my time currently at this university at Stanford here, where we're both sitting today, subhanAllah, um, we're sitting in my department here of psychiatry, <laughs> and um, my time is split up between actual clinical work, so actually seeing real patients, as well as the lab, which is research and writing and publishing and mentoring. I have an, a, actually a fairly large lab in which there's a number of um, students, undergraduate, graduate, and even postdoc, who are... Um, a student still and they're being mentored in this lab to be able to then themselves be able to publish and themselves be able to do this research and the third part of the work that I do is teaching so I teach courses here both to our residents our medical graduates and psych their psychology grads which and also our undergrads as well Allah. yeah that's very inspiring and I'm, I'm so happy to see a Muslim woman in the space like in all honesty um, I haven't heard of many um, psychiatrists not even just attendings, but professors, mashallah, uh, at a great, uh, um, academically very great uh, um, uh, university and institute. Um, just nearing the end of, um, sadly, of this conversation, um, where you are at right now um, with your work, with the Quran, how do you find practical uses of your learnings of the Quran day to day, whether it's the patients that you see, whether it's the work that you, your, the research that you do, the courses, um, how do you see manifestations, do you think, of the Qur'an? Because like you said, you didn't even know you were going to do psychiatry. And Allah just took you and he put you in this specific position and in this specific institute. And what manifestations do you see of this Qur'an? Yeah, subhanAllah. What my teacher said that early, in those years and years ago, absolutely rings true. That the Qur'an is in fact the doorway, you know, is the key to the doorway of any form of da'wah work you wish to do. Um, I never had grown up... Um, I wonder for you, but certainly in my generation, there had never been uh, a lecture, a, a khutbah, a, a class, nothing in which that had combined or kind of brought together psychiatry or mental health, I should say more broadly, and Islam. I'd never heard of such a connection. We heard of surgery. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we heard of the sciences, the people. humanities. We heard all kinds of things that the early Muslims did. Never heard about psychiatry. And so the Quran here has been incredible in that it's, um, first, first of all, there's a trust factor. There's something to be said about having been an ustada before becoming a physician, subhanAllah, um, particularly a psychiatrist. 
there is something about direct patient care, like one-to-one care, and also the care that I, you know, just on a community level. Because there is, yes, of course, my clinic here that's specific to Stanford. I don't have a private practice. I work within the university. However, I have helped now found a few different uh, Muslim-based therapy clinics. So on the community level. And to have the trust there, too. There is something to be said when a person comes and they're also having all that trepidation about therapy and psychiatry and they're not sure about all this, just like I had been, subhanAllah. And to know that the person that is delivering this or has helped found the organization such as Maristan and all the therapists, that maybe it's not me directly, but it's a therapist that I help train or that I have chosen to become part of this institution, Maristan, that they are the ones delivering this. It's coming from an Islamically integrated approach, which is a Quranic-based approach. Right? In order to say, here is the ways in which we integrate Islam. And there's a whole modality of therapy that I helped um, develop along with some colleagues called TIIP, Traditionally Islamically Integrated Psychotherapy. And when people realize, oh, there's a modality that is actually proven to work in therapy that is Islamically integrated, it's Quran and Hadith based. Right? And just this morning, I just came from, I was giving um, a presentation to my colleagues actually for some work I'm doing on the topic of suicide, which is, again, very difficult to do. And I'm talking about the trainings we do with imams, where we developed, actually in my lab, an entire manual, it's about 100 pages, of research on suicide from a medical, psychiatric point of view, and also marrying into it all of the Islamic fiqhi elements of what the Islam says about this topic. It hasn't ever been created before, alhamdulillah, tabarakallah. And then taking this and training our imams. And one of the questions they asked me was, you know, how do the imams respond to this? And I say, well, there is the medical part of this, which we present. But a lot of the questions and kind of this back and forth discussion is very heavily theological. Mm. What is the hukum on this? What is the ruling? Is this person in their wa'i or are they not? There's a lot of fiqhi elements in this. And then there's the verses of the Quran and then the hadith that have rulings that we have to derive. If I didn't have this training, it would have been exceedingly hard to stand in front of a room full of imams who are trained in this and be able to have a conversation and dialogue that then allows them to feel, okay, I can go back home to my home masjid and community and actually from the minbar deliver a khutbah about suicide prevention, Mm -hmm. which is part of our deen. I remind them to say one life is as though you've saved all of humanity. It's in the Quran. To see the light bulb go off but because we've been able to speak the same language, the language of the Sharia. If that wasn't there, if the Quran wasn't backing me in this way, it wouldn't have been possible. SubhanAllah, it really is that Allah is the best of planners. And I really, this is, this is a leading question. But do you feel that you starting your entire life essentially with the Quran, this wanting to go to Syria to have New Jersey party. Do you yes. think, subhanAllah, do you think that made you who you are today? Which I know I know you're, you're not going to say that you're amazing, but you are amazing. MashaAllah, may Allah preserve you and increase you. Amen. Amen. Um, where you are today and the work that you have, Allah has picked you out to do um, the, mm-hmm. the very essential work like you're describing um, for, um, uh, for for the, for the community and the ummah really. Do you, how, how do you think, it's a leading question. How do you think the Quran took you there? It is. It was very, I was quite young. Yes, you're right, SubhanAllah. And it's, it's been with me all along. The thing I said earlier about when you have to fight for something, yeah, it doesn't come easy because it didn't come easy to me. None of these stages actually, SubhanAllah, but it's probably made it even that more meaningful. When you, um, the Quran has this beautiful, it's a miracle. And this is why, for example, anybody, and I want to give this message today that anybody Anybody, anybody <laughs> can access the Quran. I mean it. I mean, we've seen people who have just converted and they're not even at Alif Ta'ta, you know, and eventually become Hufat and people who receive Ijazah. We've, I've seen it in, with my own eyes, Mashallah. right? And I've seen elderly people. I haven't, I guess Khadija, you'll have the honor of getting this on your podcast first. My father, may Allah bless him, and my parents are, I wouldn't mention them today, but yet, but they are a major part of the story. Uh, my father, uh, my mother and father. My father, subhanAllah, had always wanted to go to Al-Azhar. And he didn't have the opportunity to as a physician. And oh. subhanAllah, they told him, you had to have come to us when you were a, a little child. And he said, oh, subhanAllah. And he had, he said, I was in medical school. And one of the, my, my grandfather, rahimahullah, had, had, had kept the company of the shuyukh. 
So alhamdulillah, <laughs> mashallah, in Egypt. And they said, uh, he said, one of the shiuch gave my father the opportunity. He said, I'll, I'll recite to you. I'll, I'll um, let you recite to me if you promised this. And he said, it was in the middle of medical school, and I just couldn't. And I, it was the biggest regret of my life to not have completed my Quran when I was young. And he said, I started, but I just couldn't uh, fully grasp. Well, here's my father now, about in, in his 70s, about to turn 70. And um, this this year has just completed his hafiz. MashaAllah. I don't even know what to say, subhanAllah. I don't either. That is so beautiful. All I can tell you is, as he started to come into his retirement age from being a physician, um, and physicians never really retire, you know, they never really retire. They can never get themselves to, he's teaching and he's going here and there and teaching and this and that. And, but we saw him as, you know, ta- as his responsibilities at work um, came less. He, you would see him and it doesn't matter every morning, every time I would visit them, early Fajr and late at night, he would, he would be sitting and doing his hifz. And I would say, and he would say to us, you know, there's this beautiful Arabic saying that when you, <laughs> that when you memorize when you're young, it's like you're etching in stone. It, re- it it's retained. But if you're older, it's like you're writing in water. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> and he says, "I'm just writing in water. I can't retain this." And we'd say, "No, no, Baba, keep going." And um, Subhanallah, he came to us this last after three year journey of, of a really intense memorization with a sheikh one on one. And he goes to his groups and he has his you know. And he said, "I'm reciting with people who are so little." And we'd say, "Keep going, keep going," oh. you know. And um, he completed. That, I'm sure that he makes completed. you. And he's over the moon. I'm Allahu sure Akbar. he is Allahu over Akbar. the moon. Allahu Akbar. Allah, mashallah. And so just to say the journey is a lifelong journey. And it's yeah. for anybody, young, old, male, female, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you're t-t-t-ting in the beginning or you are fluent or you need to correct some of the, you know, whatever dialect you may have learned Arabic, you need to correct it a little bit, whatever it may be. Or a very, very busy mom. But you kind of take the opportunities as they come and you keep praying for doors to open because the first step, is the intention. And the next step, do you take your step? We know this from the hadith at Qudsi, right? That you take your step, Allah takes, he comes walking, you go walking, he comes at speed, subhanAllah. But it's it's um it's a beautiful thing. And you don't know who the Qabul, who the accept, who Allah has actually accepted it from. It could not be that person who memorized Quran when they were a kid and kind of was called a hafid for the rest of their lives, but actually learned it at the age of 70, 80. Or um, subhanAllah, I I'm so happy to hear that. And I'm so happy that you shared that with us. Um, mabruk, um, you know. Yes, um, and this is, a, you know, we can have an ijazah party for him. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes we need to have a party. party. <laughs> we have to have a party for him, yes. Please put it <laughs> on your Instagram. I'm okay. all here for it. <laughs> Just need my binoculars. So, you know, I almost didn't let them do an ijazah party for me for the Ashara, but they said, you know, that they said the same thing I had been saying all along. You don't know who young girl in the audience or who older woman or who anybody was in the audience that might be inspired. And subhanAllah, in this year since, I've had so many different women come up to me and say, I saw that video. And I started a few who actually even started their ashara. MashaAllah. And I was just blown away. May Allah accept. May Allah accept. Yeah. Allah accept. And I'm, I'm very glad, honestly, going back to, I'm finishing with that photo. I'm glad you did that because I was just mindlessly scrolling on Instagram. And I was like, oh. And I was, subhanAllah, it was a moment of inspiration because, like I said, we show off everything else. And I want to see the Quran being shown off, obviously for the right reasons, but you will inspire someone. And you definitely inspired me. Um, may Allah preserve you. May Allah preserve you um, and your parents yeah. and your children. Um, you truly are someone special, even though I, I just had the honor of meeting you. Um, to me and, and my family, honestly, um, we, I remember my dad's used you as an example, mashallah. Um, so I, I mean, I'm excited. Be much better than me, I'm so excited to, to, to tell my family that I got to sit down with you and um, I'm sure today's conversation will benefit many people, bi-idhnillah. Uh, may Allah accept all the work that you do, the amazing work that you do and preserve you um, and inshallah give you hasil khatima, the best of endings inshallah uh, and make you a person of the Quran, bi-idhnillah. Um, fiki, I think that completes our episodes. Um, and Jazakumullah khairan for listening. Um, I wish we had more time, uh, but this completes um, our episode. Barakallah Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.